Hello. In this clip from our Justia webinar, Build Your All-Star Team with Inclusive Interviewing, Amal Yassin will show you how bias can impact the recruiting and retention processes within your organization, allowing valuable people to walk away from your team. Remember, if you want to see more Justia videos on law practice and legal marketing, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Welcome, everyone. So happy to see you here. And I'm so glad that you've decided to, to join us for this important programming, which is called the key to inclusive interviewing. So I know many of you are interested in this topic because we would like to ensure that we live in a more equitable world. And very often the interviewing process is the sort of welcome to your company, your law firm, your brand. And if the person who's being interviewed does not feel included, it can have many harmful repercussions. Thank you so much. My name is Ama Carrie Carrie Yawson. I am an attorney and a diversity consultant. My company, Miles Tales, provides diversity training and diversity consulting services to universities, corporations, nonprofits, as well as law firms and other organizations. So now you know about me. In terms of my career as a lawyer, I uh, graduated from University of Pennsylvania Law School and Wharton for my MBA. And I had the pleasure of working at Cleary Gottlieb, Steen and Hamilton, and then Citigroup before entering my own journey as an entrepreneur. So what are we going to do today? We're going to have our welcome and introduction, some of which I've already done. We're going to discuss from a holistic perspective how implicit bias rec uh, impacts recruiting and retention. We are going to discuss the common forms of bias that happen during the interview process. We need to bring these issues into our awareness so that we can work to make sure that they are not rearing their ugly heads, right? Then we're going to discuss, this is the most important part, tools to interrupt common forms of bias during the interview process. We're going to discuss everyday opportunities to promote equity. And then we'll have our conclusion and our recap. So welcome. This is me. Now you know me, right? Short here in that picture. <laughs> Longer look now, but the same lady. And if you ever want to get in contact with me, um, the name of my organization is Miles Tales Publishing and Training, and I'm a diversity and inclusion trainer, speaker, and consultant. The intention of this program today is to foster a feeling of belonging during this often divisive time, a feeling of community, to foster greater cross-cultural understanding, to give you tools that enable confidence, and as always the idea of rehumanizing each other. So often in this very polarized society, we forget that at the bottom of it all, you're all human beings. Thank you so much. All right, so let's first examine the impact of bias on recruiting and retention at organizations. We're going to discuss a couple of phenomena. We have phantom job openings, which you may be wondering what that is, but don't worry, we'll explain it. Implicit bias in recruiting, fit tests, microaggressions at work, and bias performing, performance reviews. We're going to discuss how all of these really unfortunately continue to pervade recruiting and retention at law firms and at other organizations. It is unfortunate, but this is still happening to this day. So let's discuss phantom job openings. These are job openings that are not true. They're not real. They're like a phantom. This is a quote about it. Companies and institutions will interview people to pad out a candidate roster only in order to get approval to hire someone they've already chosen for the role. They don't mind wasting job seekers' time on fake interviews just to satisfy a policy. This was actually in Forbes, okay? So this is a known, studied, written about phenomena, and I'm sure many of you may have experienced it. You may have gone on an interview where you felt like something wasn't right. You felt like, oh my goodness, right? It, this seemed as if it was just... Uh, routine. Like it wasn't genuine. It could have been a phantom job opening. So if we care about equity 
and making sure that we are able to get the best candidate by having an open system. We need to get rid of this. No more fake job openings when job seekers are getting excited, putting on their suits, coming to an interview when you already have it firmly in your mind that another candidate is going to get the job. Let's work on earnest job openings, uh, authentic job openings rather than phantom job openings. And that requires having an open mind. Even when you think someone might be great for the, for the position, that you actually in earnest give people an opportunity. Next up, we have implicit bias in recruiting. So these studies that I'm sharing with you are incredibly sobering. We have the White and Resume Study by Catherine DeSellis and her colleagues and company. Uh, and then we have the Job Callback Study by the late uh, sociologist uh, Dave Pager. Okay, so let's talk about the White and Resume Study. So employer callbacks for resumes that were whitened fared much better in the application pile than those that included ethnic information, even though the qualifications listed were identical. So what's the backstory? What do I mean by that? These researchers actually created resumes that were identical in terms of job application, a job, job, um, job information and education and so forth. All the qualifications are the same. So we have these two resumes that are identical. Then we make one a white in one and one's an ethnic one. So let's say the genuine resume belonged to someone named Kathy Choi. And it says that the person is a part of the Asian and Pacific Islander uh, Association. And it says that the person, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, has other ethnic details about, you know, a favorite food that may be a food that is associated with Asia. So we have this resume. On the other hand, we are now going to whiten it. Instead of it saying, you know, Catherine or Kathleen Choi, it's going to say Catherine or Kathleen Smith. Instead of saying the person is a member of the Asian Students Association or Asian American Students Association, it's going to say that the person uh, plays, I'm not going to just make up a sport, the person plays field hockey, right? We are going to just change the details of the resume so that it is very, very hard to detect that the person is a member of a racial minority in this country. So now they put the resumes out there. And they did this, you know, for, for, for multiple uh, d demographics. They did it for black candidates. Let's say the person's name is Jamal Jackson and the person's a part of the Black Law Students Association and the person enjoys playing, you know, basketball. They change it to this person's name is actually John ja Johnson or John Jackson or they, they change a certain name or maybe not John Jackson, John Witherspoon. Like they just make up another name and they think sounds a little white to people and they put other sports they say the person is a member of you know plays polo the member of a country club i'm not sure right i'm just making it up for example so they whiten the resume these were the results 25 percent of black candidates received callback from their whitened resume while only 10 percent got calls when they left ethnic details intact whoa that is a big difference 25 percent versus 10 percent Similar result for people of Asian ancestry. 21% got calls if they used the white in resume, whereas only 11.5% heard back if they sent resumes with racial references. Very sobering, meaning individuals who thought that they were potentially well intentioned, they thought that they that they that they were looking at resumes fairly, clearly were not. They had an implicit bias towards candidates of color. This is another study, the job callback study by Dave Pager, uh, uh, may, she, may she rest in peace, a really phenomenal sociologist out of Princeton. So basically what she did, and she used Princeton students as part of her study, is she set them out. She told some of them to say that they had a criminal record. They told She told some of them to say they did not have a criminal record. Hmm. Interesting, interesting fact. She went about this study trying to focus on the impact of former incarceration on job prospects. She came back 
with results that made her recognize that she really needed to be focused on something else. And that was race. So 34 percent of white candidates without a criminal record got a callback. 17 percent of white candidates with a criminal record got a callback. Now, let's compare it to the black candidate. 14 percent of the black candidates without a criminal record got a callback as opposed to 5% of Black candidates with a criminal record. I want you to focus on that for a moment and tell me what seems a bit odd and shocking about this. Just look at it for a moment. Well, this is probably what you discovered. White candidates with a criminal record feared better than Black candidates without a criminal record. The researcher was shocked by this. How on earth is that being black is more of a handicap than a criminal record? Shocking, 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 but true. So we recognize that there is certainly an implicit bias where people are walking around with the same information, same credentials, but based on their ethnicity, based on their race, they are getting these very different results. Next, we have fit test. Oh, I love talking about this because unfortunately this is still happening and we need to get it to stop. So I remember being a, at this point, I had not yet entered the legal profession, but I've certainly, you know, heard when I first heard it, I had not yet entered the legal profession, but it certainly happens in the legal profession. I was literally told by a manager when the manager was sending me off to do interviews. Test for and it goes by different names. Sometimes people call it the beer test. Oh, would you want to have a beer with this person? Sometimes they call it an elevator test. Oh, would you be sad or happy to be stuck in an inner, it, well, who's going to be happy <laughs> being stuck in an elevator? But if you had to choose someone, would you choose this person to be stuck in an elevator or you're stuck at the airport? Your flight, you know, to, to do a transaction gets delayed and you're stuck. It's stuck. Is this someone that you want to hang out with? Is this someone that you want to be chummy chummy with? I was told to answer that question to see whether the person would get to the next round of interviews with the company. This is a very, very popular, very, very widespread way of weeding candidates. Let's look at this quote. When you're hiring someone, you need to consider how they'll fit into corporate culture. Sometimes you'll have trouble figuring that out. Try imagining you'd like to have a beer with them after work. This is being said out loud. This is the problem with this. It has serious implications with respect to lack of equity because very often we feel comfortable with people who are more like us racially, ethnically, socioeconomically, just name all of the leads, right? We feel more comfortable. And so we're basically saying we are creating a culture and an organization which is more homogeneous because we're all looking for people who are quote unquote more like us. And this is incredibly problematic in our segregated country. Look at this. This was from the Washington Post. Three quarters of white people do not have a single non-white Facebook friend. That said, white people and people of color are often having very separate conversations and engaging in separate activities. So people of color very often will not fit. People with disabilities very often will not fit. People um, of, a, of a different gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, we can just keep on naming it and naming it and naming it, will not fit if we are to engage in these fit tests. So why don't we actually talk about realness? And I mean, people sometimes say, um, uh, no, 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 you can't talk about realness. I am someone who generally wants to have conversations about what is attracting you to this role? Where do you see yourself uh, You know, developing? How do you want to develop? as an attorney, these sort of deeper, more probing questions without running a file, a file, pardon me, of various laws, we can ask people questions that really allow us to get to know them. And the goal is to make sure that we have a diverse organization where we are all stretching and learning from each other, not where everyone is the same. Next up, microaggressions at work. Okay, so now this term is very, very, very often, uh, I would say, bantered about. Oh, that was a microaggression. That was a microaggression. Let's go to the real definition. Brief and commonplace daily verbal behavioral and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, very important, either intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile 
derogatory or negative blight and insults to a target person or group, and that target person or group can be part of a race, a gender, sexual organization, ability or disability, etc. There are three types. Micro assault. Now these are horrible. This kind of feels like someone punching you, but the person is not physically punching you. If I go into an office and there's a new stare, it is uh, referring to, it is suggesting a lynching, which would be horrifying to see. A micro assault, a micro insult where someone may think they are giving you a compliment, but because of the embedded stereotype, they're actually insulting you or your demographic of people. Oh my goodness, you speak English so well. Oh, you're so articulate. Or then, I mean, this is more clearly, and so you're only here because of affirmative action. And then we have micro invalidations where people are acting as if people like you don't even exist. When I see you, I don't see color. These are microaggressions at work. And unfortunately, these are incredibly commonplace, incredibly commonplace. Unfortunately, at work, people are making these comments. Now, an isolated one comment out in 10 years is usually not going to uh, cause someone to leave a organization or a law firm. If it's just a one-off, one thing that happened during a long period of time. But unfortunately, very often when it's happening over and over and over and over again, it's like, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts or whatever that phrase is, the person then is really feeling as if he, she, or they at their wit's end cannot take it anymore and does not want to be a part of the firm anymore, does not want to be a part of the organization anymore. Microaggressions at work very often has a huge impact on retention and very hard to know because very often you have your exit interview and people just want to leave on good terms so they're not going to say the truth they're not going to say people are rude to me all the time i've got all these you know insults and flights and micro invalidations that i felt that this was a really hostile environment people very often do not say that and so it's hard for hr managers to even recognize the horrible impact it's having on retention next up Biased performing reviews, performance reviews. Now, this this study, which you know, well, it's it's not incredibly re recent. I've been using this for for years, but I unfortunately think that it probably it most definitely still happens. This is the biased performance reviews. Now, this was a phenomenal study by leadership consulting firm in which they basically created a memo. They put mistakes in the memo on purpose, and it was basically the same memo. They sent the memo to partners, and 50% of the partners were told it was a third-year African-American associate named Thomas Mayer who attended NYU. The other 50% received it were told it was a Caucasian associate who had attended NYU. It was the same exact memo, the same exact words. The same language, the same mistakes, identical. Even the name was the same. All they said was, this is that person's African-American, this person's Caucasian. What happens? They asked the partners to score the memo. 3.2 out of 5 was the rating given to the hypothetical African-American associate, where Thomas Mayer received a 4.1 out of 5. Nearly a full point difference. Can you imagine? And it was the same exact memo. And so if we extrapolate and say, uh-oh, in some cases, associates of color, new attorneys of color are being graded more harshly. They're having evaluations that are harsher. What is that going to do for retention? Clearly, people do not want to get lower marks or lower evaluations from the same quality of work that their colleague is doing. This is incredibly demoralizing. And so we will see various individuals leaving organizations when this lack of equity exists, when this bias persists, which has real implications, right? Even from a financial perspective, we're thinking about how bonuses are calculated in some industry. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did enjoy it, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more law practice and legal marketing videos. See you in our next clip.